Oh, it's starting. Mm. Okay. Perfect. Father God, we come to you under the name of Jesus. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace and your goodness and your kindness that has been chasing after us, Lord, all these days through uh, all the semester. And right now we are here at the end of the semester, Lord, as we are uh, about to have this class. God, I pray that Jesus, Holy Spirit, you will speak with us, strengthen us in our inner man, Lord. And God, I pray that Jesus, we will understand more about you. Uh, our understanding about you will be enlarged today as we listen to pastors uh, teaching, Lord. God, I pray that Jesus, every single minute will be uh, spent for your glory, for, for your honor, Jesus. And God, I thank you for Pastor Deepika, for all the blessings that you have given her uh, so that she can teach us, so that she can equip us, Lord, for your kingdom. And God, I thank you for all my classmates. We pray for good Wi-Fi connections throughout the session, Lord. And we give you all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, we have been looking at First Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians. So today, of course, we will be finishing uh, Second Thessalonians. Um, the first, in the First Thessalonians, we saw that the main focus of Paul's letter was on the wrong um, impression which these Thessalonian believers had uh, that the believers among them who have passed away um, are no are not with the Lord. So they were worried. They were thinking uh, that they have been eagerly, trustingly waiting for Jesus' return. Uh, but now believers have started to pass away from old age and maybe from sickness. And so they are worried what's going to happen to these people who have passed away before the coming of Jesus. So uh, in the first letter, Paul assures them that they too are safe in the Lord, even the ones who have died are with the Lord. And in fact, when he comes back to collect those who are remaining here, the ones who have passed away will come along uh, with Jesus to um, collect the believers who are here. In the second letter, we saw that the main focus is upon another wrong impression which these believers had. Someone had told them uh, that uh, Jesus has already come and collected his faithful ones and gone back. Uh, and they have been left behind. And maybe that's the reason why they are undergoing such intense persecution. It's because they have been abandoned. They were not found worthy. So then Paul uh, writes this letter assuring them that it is Jesus who will make them worthy of his calling. Uh, he, he tells them in chapter 2, he says that by his resurrection power, God will make us worthy of his calling. He will fulfill the desire that we have to be good, to be righteous. He will also fulfill um, every good work that we take up in faith, you know, for the name of Jesus. So uh, Paul assures them that they are on the right track and that the day of the Lord has not yet come. And he goes on to uh, tell them that two things will occur before the second coming happens. Uh, the first um, sign of the coming will be the rebellion. So we see that he mentions that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. He says, first, there will be a rebellion, which will be uh, like a massive um, you know, um, um, exodus from the uh, church. Lots and lots of people, thousands of people will, will start leaving the true church of God they will start creating alternate fake churches for themselves where they can um, do whatever they wish, where they can compromise on God's word however they want to. Uh, so these will be fake churches. Uh, these will be churches that don't really honor God at all. So in fact, these would be churches, you know, if you were to use the revelation terminology, these are churches uh, whose lamp has been removed from the presence of Jesus. He's no longer watching over them, protecting them. So those are the kind of fake churches which will arise. Uh, so he says there will be a great rebellion in the end time when everyone will move away from the true church. And the second thing he says is that the man of lawlessness will be revealed. 
and only after these two things occur will the second coming happen um as for the timing of the rapture that would be different i mean that uh, is something that he does not talk about over here uh, he just only briefly talks about the rapture in uh, the in the previous letter the first thessalonian letter chapter 4 um so here um we kind of stopped uh, when we were talking about this man of lawlessness Uh, so we are somewhere around verses 4 5 and uh, so on so if we could have someone read out for us uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 uh, verses 4 uh, maybe all the way up to verse um 10 if we could have someone read out for us 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 4 to 10 please yeah verse 4 who oppose who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called god or that is worshiped so that he sits as god in the temple of god showing himself that he is god do you not remember that when i was still with you i told you these things and now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way and then the lawless one will be revealed whom the lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of satan with all power signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved and for this reason god will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness yes uh, yeah so um here uh, paul elaborates a little bit upon this man of lawlessness he says that um this will be a person who will uh, set himself up in god's temple proclaiming himself to be god um so we are told that right now uh there is a force that is holding back the lawlessness and the man of lawlessness uh but a time will come when this power this force which is holding uh, these things back will be taken out of the way and at that time both lawlessness and rebellion and the man of lawlessness will be able to come forth and do their work because the, you know the restraint which has been placed uh, upon them will be removed um now this is generally believed that over here uh, paul is indirectly referring to the holy spirit uh, so in verse 6 when paul says and now you know what is holding him back it's referring to the holy spirit who's holding back both lawlessness and the man of lawlessness um and in verse 7 we are told the secret power of lawlessness is already at work but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way and in fact we see that we see lawlessness on the increase uh, when i say lawlessness i'm not I'm not just talking about people who break uh, the laws laid down by a government i'm talking about uh, lawlessness against god you know where um, uh, now people are uh, more open about opposing god's law uh they uh they in fact are proud of their uh, rebellious actions um uh, in fact people boast about their wickedness you know so lawlessness is on the increase uh, maybe a few centuries ago uh, even though sin was there even i know at that point of time people were a little more um, hesitant about openly displaying their acts of wickedness they would try to hide Uh, they would at least try to use a screen of hypocrisy you know to hide behind now p- 
people are proud of their lawlessness. So you have uh, what we call progressive churches now, where people boast about how they are compromising upon the word of God. They say, oh, the word of God, uh, you know, does not have to be followed stringently. It's meant to adapt to the times. And so they, you know, in these progressive churches, they think that they are being very, very progressive and they are boasting about how they are, um, they, how they are diluting the word of God so that they can be progressive in nature. You know, that, that, that's the claim which they make. So we see that this lawlessness is already at work, but it is kind of being restrained and um, kept within its limits by the Holy Spirit. Um, but uh, Paul says, a day will come when the Holy Spirit will be taken out of the way. And this is an indirect reference to the rapture. So when uh, Jesus Christ comes back and he collects his people in the air and takes them back uh, to heaven, at that time, uh, the direct working of the Holy Spirit through the church of God, you know, will no longer be there. Now, you know, when we intercede for the for the nations, now when we go and share the gospel, you know, now when we are uh, actively working to be the salt and light of the earth, even as we are doing all of this, the Holy Spirit is there among us. We are his temple and he is actively working uh, to keep lawlessness in check, in control. But once the church of God is raptured and removed, you know, once this temple of God is removed, the holy the presence of the uh, direct presence of the holy spirit also is removed now this does not mean that the holy spirit is completely taken out of the earth uh, the lord continues to you know operate over here but he is he will no longer be actively at work the way he is right now through the church so whether we realize it or not we are in fact playing a very very important role in these last days um the Holy Spirit is literally using our hands, our feet, you know, our mouth, even uh, as we are, you know, um, spreading his light in this world. Uh, it is our prayers which is keeping violence under control. It is because of our prayers that persecution has not completely suppressed and wiped out, uh, you know, the, the church. So it is our prayers which is at work uh, right now which is holding back lawlessness. So we are actually playing a very, very vital role. Those who are sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, those who are trying to live in accordance with the, uh, you know, with, with the word of God, uh, the Lord is using such people to advance his kingdom. There's a lot happening behind the scenes. When we look with our human eyes, we may think that wickedness is, you know, is winning uh, the war. And that uh, the believe the churches, the church is helpless, just standing somewhere in the background, unable to do anything. Maybe that's the wrong impression that we would get when we look at uh, the activity of the activities of the church today in the um, in the natural. When we look at it through human eyes, but in the supernatural, there's a lot happening behind the scenes. The Holy Spirit is using His church. He is using those who have set themselves apart for apart for Him. Such people, he is using them in a powerful way to achieve things which may not be apparent in the uh, you know, physical realm. So right now, this is the era of the Holy Spirit. This is the uh, time of the church. And the Lord is using us to accomplish a lot. There are many things being released in the spiritual realm, whether we realize it or not. And then when the time is ready, the Lord will come back. And our, our work, the work of the church will be finished and we will be raptured and taken away. And at that time, the tribulation period would begin. There would be intense uh, persecution because now the, the Holy Spirit is no longer holding back lawlessness. So the time of uh, uh, persecution will increase. Uh, but at that point, at that time, there would be a new generation of Christians being formed. You know, people who make a commitment uh, to, to trust in the Lord Jesus in spite of now living in a world where, uh, you know, um, evil is completely being openly celebrated. 
So uh, that will be the tribula tribulation period during which time you will still have people coming to the Lord. There will still be people getting saved. But um, the, the way the church is operating now, it will no longer operate openly at that uh, point of time during the tribulation period. So regarding those times, Paul speaks and he says, uh, once the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way, the lawless one will be revealed, he says in verse 8. Um, and he goes on to assure uh, that this lawless one, we, he will be overthrown with the breath of the Lord's mouth. Uh, the, through the splendor of the Lord's coming, uh, this lawless one will be uh, destroyed, is what we are told in uh, verse 8. So we see this happening. Uh, we are told in Revelation in um, Revelation 1.20 and then again later in Revelation 20.10, we are told that this man of lawlessness um, and uh, the false prophet who is working along with him, these two will be cast into the lake of fire along with, uh, the, along with Satan and all of his demons. So all of these uh, will be will be destroyed by the splendor of the Lord's coming. And all of these powers, false powers, will be overthrown by the breath of the Lord's mouth, is what we are uh, told. So we know the end. We know that the victory will be the Lord's. But in the meantime, for a little while, Satan will be allowed to have uh, greater reign. Uh, we see that in verse 9, where Paul says, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. Uh, this lawless one will function in the same way Satan has always been working. How? He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. So uh, this lawless one uh, will be a person who will hold um, uh, a lot of super, all kinds of supernatural powers uh, so uh, earlier when we were looking at verse 4, uh, you know, we saw uh, it says over there that this man, the, the, this lawless one, he would set himself up in God's temple. And last class, while we were just kind of finishing off, we, we talked about this. Uh, we talked about the significance of this man setting himself up, up in God's temple. Right now, uh, in the place where the temple was uh, you know earlier situated there right now you have a mosque standing so right now the temple of jerusalem does not even exist uh, but uh, it is it is likely that it will be rebuilt at some point of time and when it is rebuilt uh, there is a chance that this man of lawlessness uh, you know will establish himself in that jerusalem temple so that is one belief but then there are other people who say it's not really um, this man of lawlessness will not just be restricted to the Jewish people. He will not only be a leader of the Jewish people. In fact, he will be a leader of everyone who considers themselves followers of Yahweh. You know, so which means um, this man, uh, this Antichrist, probably will become a, an important main leader of the a false church itself, you know, the church which has gone into rebellion and which has, um, you know, established its own uh, system apart from the word of God. So maybe he will become a leader of the uh, church itself, not just a leader sitting in the Jewish temple uh, and, you know, just calling himself the leader of the Jews. So this would be a worldwide leader who will use all sorts of powers of display, all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders, we are told. Um, and it says in verse 10, and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. So he will, uh, this man, he will be given the power, the ability to, to do signs and wonders, which will deceive people and make them think that he is a great messiah, that he's a great savior who can do much for the people uh, you know, uh, of the church. So many will follow him thinking that he is uh, an angel of light, you know, we can say, uh, because 
we are told in um, 2 Corinthians 11, 14, you know, where it talks about false teachers and there, where it says, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. So this man will be like that. He will work in the same way that Satan works. He will portray himself as an angel of light who can do signs and wonders, who can help people, who can improve humanity. So um, uh, the, 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 the false church will really look up to him and admire him. The world will have respect for him. So he will portray himself as a good person, not as an evil person. And this is what it says about how people will respond to this uh, evil one. Um, it says, uh, they perish, you know, all these people who are who will believe in the lie, they will perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Uh, and we are told in verse 12, so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. There's a contrast between verses 10 and 12 over here. Um, these are people who refuse to love the truth. And these are people who delight in wickedness. So because of this combination where even though they have heard a little bit of the, about the truth, they do not want it because it will, in, it will involve, you know, submission. It will involve obedience to the Lord. It will involve changing and giving up many, many things. So they refuse to love the truth, but rather these are people who will delight in wickedness. They enjoy sin. So such people will allow themselves to be deceived by this false uh, messiah. I know this man of lawlessness will probably say, oh, it is all right to bend the rules of the Bible. This uh, man of lawlessness will probably say, um, you know, um, God expects us to adapt to our current times and follow whatever culture is prevailing, you know, in our present day. So all these false teachings uh, will be believed uh, by these people because they, they don't want to accept the truth anyway, and they delight, they enjoy wickedness. So such people will be very easily deceived by this man who is doing all kinds of signs and wonders. So that is why in verse 11, it says, for this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. So when, when someone is determined to believe uh, falsehood, God will um, allow them to believe in what they want. So, uh, you know, we see this, we see God doing this in other places. Uh, two examples. In Romans chapter 1, we see God adapting this kind of an approach uh, towards people who deliberately want to turn away from the truth. Um, if we could have someone read out for us Romans chapter 1, verses 21 to 25, we see uh, you know a very, very similar thought being expressed over here. Uh, Revelation, um, Romans chapter 1, sorry, Romans chapter 1, 21 to 25, please. Romans 1, 21 to 25. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God has also, therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped, the, worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Yes. So here uh, we are told in verse 21, although they knew God, you know, they chose the light. So um, it, in verse 25, it says they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. So this was a deliberate turning away. 
you know, uh, people in on Judgment Day cannot stand there and pretend and say, oh, we did not know the truth. If they had a heart for the truth, the Lord would have revealed himself to them. So um, uh, no one can use that excuse that they did not know the truth. Uh, those who are seeking actively, you know, in their hearts for the truth will find it. Because those who are trying to reach, uh, uh, reach God and draw near to God, God will draw near to them. Uh, that's a fact. So, uh, so here it talks about people who, even though they have known God, they have seen the hand of a creator in creation and in uh, you know in all the things that God is doing for them. By you know, in the sense of um, providing for them, taking care of them, even though they can sense uh, the living presence of a God, uh, of, of a living God in all of these things. They deliberately chose to exchange the truth about God for a lie, it says over here. And therefore, it says in verse 24, it says, therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts. Okay, So God gave them over and said, OK, fine. If you want to follow the lie, I will give you over to the lie. Follow it. Do what you want you know, uh, with it. Um, and here, in the second thessalonians we see the same thought being expressed where it says for this reason god sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie um we see this uh, wording in romans 11 8 you know where, where uh, paul is talking about the uh, jewish people who re who rejected jesus you know all those who refused to believe in the truth uh, so over there in romans 11 8 um, Paul says, as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see and ears that could not hear to this very day. God gave them a spirit of stupor. That word stupor over there is talking about um, a kind of senselessness. You know, it's like almost uh, being unconscious, being unaware of what's going on around you. It's like, you know, when a, if a person is in a drugged state, and they're able to barely think. Uh, you would basically use that word stupor, you know, as in they are um, they 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 can't uh, think. They they're not able to uh, recognize. Uh, they're in a kind of um, half awake, ha you know, half asleep condition. So um, it says that God would give such people a spirit of stupor. Those who want to deceive themselves, he he will say, all right, you know, if you want to uh, not recognize the truth. Fine, I will give you a spirit of stupor, is what he says in Romans 11, 8. And here in Thessalonians, we, we are told that they would be given a powerful delusion so that, you know, they would be easily deceived. So here we see God actively working to give these people what they want. Uh, now, why are we even, you know, uh, focusing so much on these verses? Uh, it's because it is like a word of warning which Paul is giving, saying that, you know, if we are not careful, we too can end up in this manner. So it's a question that we would have to ask ourselves. Um, do I love the truth or do I, do I delight in wickedness? Any believer who still loves, enjoys, delights in wickedness, who feel happy when they are involved in wicked things, and who don't really feel any joy in the things of God, you know, um, such people can even today be in danger of being deceived by the evil one. Because you see, in their hearts, they have already they're already ready to accept a lie. They are eager to accept a delusion. They want that because uh, loving the truth would involve uh, sacrifice and surrender and submission and faith, and they do not want uh, to you know, uh, to put up a spiritual fight and uh, acquire those things. They're not willing to do that. So uh, they have no love for the truth. They delight in wickedness. So it's a, it's a, it's a uh, question that we all have to ask ourselves. Um, do I enjoy, do I delight in the things of God? Or do I really love the worldly things more? Um, because if that is the case, we are in great danger of being deceived. Uh, because 
a believer can reach a point where God would give them over to their sinful desires. You know, if they, if, they, if they're not uh, letting go of those sinful desires. So there's a there's a danger here. So you know, Paul says that this is what is going to happen to the people of the world, and we, on the other hand, should not be like that. That is why in verse 13 he says, "But we ought always to thank God for you." brothers and sisters loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits. So he says, the people of the world, they are like that. They 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 don't love the truth. They delight in wickedness. And so the God is going to allow them to deceive themselves. But we, you know, we believers, you Thessalonians are different. And he goes on to talk about in what way they are different. Um, so uh, if we could have someone read out for us uh, from verse 13 up to verse 17, please. Uh, so you know that up to the end of chapter 2. So from verse 13 up to verse 17, if someone could read out, please. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you. Brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle, now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work, good word and work. Yeah. Here in verse uh, 13, um, Paul says to these Thessalonian believers, that God chose you as first fruits. That's the term that is used over there, the term first fruits. Why are these Thessalonian believers being called first fruits? In what way does this apply to us? Uh, you know, what significance does it hold even for us believers today? Um, there are two ways in which the term first fruits is used, you know, in, in the New Testament. Um, one example would be 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 15. 1 Corinthians 16, 15, where it talks about, uh, you know, someone of the household of Stephanus, some person named Stephanus and his entire household who choose to become believers. Uh, so they become the first fruits of Achaia. They are living in a region uh, called Achaia. And in that entire region, the very first family which comes forward to accept the Lord Jesus uh, is this person, Stephanus, and his household. So in that sense, uh, Stephanus and his family become the first fruits in that entire region of Achaia. But here, when you look at the Thessalonian believers, you cannot call them first fruits in that sense. Because they were not the first fruits. They were not the first believers in the region of Macedonia. If you remember, uh, you know, after that man uh, has that, um, Paul has this vision of a man from Macedonia coming and saying, you know, please come and help us. Uh, after Paul receives that vision, they don't go to Thessalonica first. They go to Philippi first. And over oh, there in Philippi, it is Lydia and her family. And the other women who are gathered over there, uh, you know, outside the city, they are the ones who place their uh, faith first in Jesus. So technically speaking, they would be the first fruits. Uh, you know, Lydia and her family, that jailer uh, who comes to the Lord, those people were the first fruits in the Macedonian region. So in, in what sense is Paul using this term when he calls uh, these people first fruits? He's actually using a, uh, you know, Old Testament term. Uh, in the Old Testament, um, one of the laws that was given to the people of Israel is that uh, once their crop is grown, you know, once the crop is ready for harvest, um, at that point, you know, when they're gathering, you know, all of their crop, they are supposed to bring the first portion of that crop 
to the temple and dedicate it to the Lord. So um, the a good select portion, you know, uh, one of the one of the one of, a choice portion, some uh, uh, a portion of the crop which is like really good, they would take the best portion of their crop, a small portion, and they would bring it to the temple and dedicate it to God. And in fact, later it's the you know the Levites and the other priests and all these uh, people in the temple would actually eat that. That would become their uh, their food source. So every every Israelite was supposed to do this. He would he is supposed to bring one the the best portion, one small portion uh, of his crop, uh, or in fact from his flock, and he would come and offer it as first fruits to the Lord. What is the significance? Basically, he's saying in the same way I have brought this small portion and dedicated it to you. I'm indicating to you, Lord, that the rest of this portion, you know, the, the, the rest of the crop which this small portion represents is also dedicated to you. So the rest of the crop, you know, he would be using it uh, for maybe some of it to, you know, to, to collect seeds for the next uh, crop season. Um, some of it, he, you know, he and his family would be eating. Some of it he would be selling for a profit. So he would be using that crop in many, many different ways. But what he's indicating is that by bringing this first fruits to you, Lord, I'm basically saying that in the same way I have set apart and dedicated this first portion to you, the rest, the remaining also, um, you know, is symbolically dedicated unto you. I will use all of it to honor you in a way that will please you. So that was the significance of first fruits. And we kind of practice that even in, um, you know, in, in church uh, today. Uh, for instance, many people, many believers, when they when they get a new job, you know, and they get their first salary, uh, they bring that to the church, to the Lord saying, Lord, you know, I'm bringing this to you as first fruits to indicate that not only am I dedicating this first salary to you, but in fact, uh, this is an indication that all the money that I would be making in the future is also dedicated unto you. I will use it in a way that will honor and please you. So um, in that sense, you know, we we continue this practice of first, of first fruits even in our churches uh, today. Here, the Thessalonians themselves are being called first fruits. They are the select choice portion that is being brought into God's presence and being set apart for him. Uh, so because this, this, this portion of crop which the people would bring to the temple, that was regarded as holy. It was regarded as set apart. Uh, not anyone can just you know, eat from that. Only the, the, the people of the temple, uh, the, the Levites who have been assigned to that particular portion, only they are allowed to take that and you know use it um, uh, for their sustenance. Everyone uh, is not just supposed to eat from that first fruits. So it's a very set apart, holy portion. These Thessalonians are being compared to that. Yeah, uh, Paul says God chose you to be first fruits. Uh, so it's a very um, uh, privileged, you know, um, position that God gave them. And all of us believers, in the same sense, we are all first fruits. We are the set apart portion. We have been set apart for God to be used by only by Him, to serve only His purposes. So we have to live with this awareness that we are first fruits. We can't live the way everyone else lives. We have been set apart for a very specific portion. We have been dedicated by Jesus to God. You know, it's like as if Jesus took us and presented us before the Father and said, see, these people, they are yours. They are set apart for you. So, you know, in, in that symbolic sense. So because uh, these Thessalonian believers were first fruits, it says um, that the sanctifying work of the Spirit you know, uh, has saved them. And he says, um, God has called you to this, uh, to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if we live as people 
uh, who are first fruits, if we live with this awareness that we have been set apart as uh, as as exclusive people meant to be used only by God for his purposes. If we live with that kind of an awareness, you know, the sanctifying work of the spirit, we will experience to a great level. The Lord will continue to sanctify us and make us more and more holy because we are living with this awareness of who we are, of, of our important status. And if we live in this way, you know, we will share in the glory of our Lord Jesus one day. Um, in passages where it talks about the second coming of the Lord and the glory that, you know, uh, that will surround him even as he comes, um, we kind of catch a glimpse of what exactly this glory of God is. It's going to be something very grand, something very awesome. Um, all the people of the world, when they see it, they will tremble. That is the glory of God. And we are told that we will share in this kind of glory with the Lord. So if today, if we are willing to live like first fruits, if we are living to, uh, if we are willing to live set apart, surrendered lives, if we are willing to do that today, tomorrow we will share in the glory of the Lord. Um, so, so that is why in in verse fifteen, Paul says, "So then, you know, because this is the privilege which you have been given, and this is the future hope which you have." Therefore, you know, so then he says in verse 15, so then brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by uh, letter. So he says, if you stand firm and hold fast to the teachings which we have, which have been given to you, then he makes a promise and he says in verse 17, then God will encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. So if you choose to stand firm, God will encourage your hearts. He will help you to hold on and go on and not give up, not to fall away, not to get tempted and you know stray away from this uh, from the path. He will encourage you, he will strengthen you, he will help you to remain firm if you choose to stand firm and hold fast to the teachings. And um, he says over here um, that the Lord will um, strengthen you in every good deed and word. This is something that we saw earlier in chapter 1, uh, where uh, uh, Paul says that God himself, by his resurrection power, he will give you what you need uh, you know, the, to, be, to be good, to be godly. Um, and it, he also says over there, that he will fulfill your desire for every good deed that you know that you want to do for God by his resurrection power, you will be able to do those things. Um, okay. Um, first fruits is mentioned only in, in the NIV, is it? Okay, fine. Then uh, you know, in another five minutes we'll have the break. I will look it up in Bible Hub uh, so that we'll see uh, why the NIV chose the other translation. All right, so we will uh, definitely do that because NIV would not have recklessly put in that wording. There would there would be a reason for it. So yes, uh, during the break time, I will just quickly look up that in Bible Hub. Um, so yes, if we stand firm in the Lord, the Lord Himself will encourage us and He will strengthen us in in the good deeds that we want to do for the uh, Lord. All right, coming into chapter three, uh, we still have uh, yeah five minutes. So uh, if we can, um, if we could have someone read out for us, uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 to, um, 1 to 7. Yes, please, if someone could read out. First Thessalonians chapter, Second Thessalonians, sorry. Second, Thess Second Thessalonians chapter 3, uh, verses 1 to 7. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. 
Now may the Lord direct your hearts in the love of God and into the patience of Christ. Yeah. Um, so here we see um, that Paul says, please pray for us that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people, for not everyone has faith. OK, so uh, it is all right to pray against persecution. And it is all right to pray against the schemes and strategies of evil people. Um, so because I'm in, um, you know, there are people who, who say that when persecution comes, it's good for the church because then the church will get refined. So yes, it is true that good will come out of persecution. However, we do have the right to pray against persecution so that the persecution, you know, uh, should not happen. Uh, so that you know believers should not have to suffer so just like paul you know requests the believers over here uh, that we should be delivered from the schemes of evil people that we, that we should be delivered from people who are trying to uh, persecute and trap the church it is all right to pray against such schemes and strategies of the evil one um, so uh, paul wants them to pray in this manner uh, for him and his team because he says the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. Uh, so if we choose to pray in this manner, that God will shield his church uh, from uh, persecution, uh, then he will protect us from certain schemes of the evil one and he will strengthen us you know, as and when we require it because it says the Lord is faithful he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. So, of course, this does not mean that, you know, all kind, all difficulty will disappear. Yes, as a church, we will always find uh, face difficulties because the world does not like us. Uh, we don't live in the way they live. So that tension would always be there. However, um, the Lord will strengthen us and he will protect us from the evil one um, because he is faithful. Uh, like it says in Romans 8, 28, the Lord will work even in the, in the, in the negative things that are happening to us. The Lord will work uh, for our good, you know, because he has called us according to his purposes. So he will only allow those things to happen to us, which are in line with his purposes. And uh, so uh, even when, when, negative, when negative things take place, he will work those things for our good. Uh, so we see this. All right. Uh, we'll go for our break and uh, we'll rejoin once again at 10. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much.